taken my notes for the video on my son's magic sketchboard. Hashtag pro YouTuber. Good morning everybody. It is my last working day of the year, which I'm a little bit bummed about because I actually do really like my job. But I also think I'm entitled to two weeks of holiday this year. So this is the outfit for the day. It's a dress. As you guys have probably gathered by now, dresses and skirts are my favorite attire. I hardly ever wear like trousers or jeans. So I'm going to be wearing this sort of like, I don't know, a bit thicker woolen dress in this absolutely stunning burnt pumpkin orange color. And I really love this dress. It has a very nice uh, V neckline here. The only thing that kind of bothers me about it is that the sleeves are like that three quarter length, so they're not like long and I can never understand winter attire with shorter sleeves. Like, what the fuck is the point of this? For my jewelry today, I've actually picked out quite the mixed bag. I'm going to wear this necklace from Ana Luisa Jewelry and also this cutesy little ring. And I'm going to wear one of these pairs of earrings, but I can't decide which one. I love both of them so much, but I've been wearing these. They're new in my collection so often that I feel like it's time to like switch it up a bit. But at the same time, I'm just so in love with these. And I'm also going to wear this ring, which is a present from my family. My uncle made this ring many, many years ago for my high school graduation. It has this beautiful zirconium in pretty much the same color as the dress. So, I mean, I have to wear it, right? I feel like as my last day for work, it's a good day to wear Coco Mademoiselle from Chanel and feel like a badass. This perfume makes me feel like a badass, don't ask. And here you have the outfit, guys. Like I said, I absolutely adore this dress, I adore the color, I really love the um, V neckline as well, those little like flappy things here, I just think it looks really really cute, very well designed. The only thing that just baffles me is those sleeves. Like I promised you a very special installment of the Pat McGrath ranking series last time and here I am delivering, not without a huge amount of technical hurdles, my third collaboration with my good friend here on YouTube, Mia from Mia's Virtual Vanity. Mia has taken upon the ambitious road of doing her version of Vlogmas uh, which she calls Mia Mas, and who the fuck doesn't want more Mia? So she's basically doing a video every day of December, and she kindly invited me to collaborate with her on her Vlogmas journey, which I felt very, very honored by, because Mia, as you know, I think most of you don't really need an introduction to Mia. The ones of you who have followed my channel for a while uh, know Mia very well and probably follow her already. But if you guys don't know who Mia is, Mia is like pretty much the Mariam 2.0. She's prettier, smarter, far more eloquent than I am, and above all, she's sassier. And if there's something we love on this channel, it's a good amount of sass. So if you're not following Mia, please go do. I'm actually super curious to see what she's going to do for her version of this video. When she invited me to do this video together, she really wanted me to be in the setting of the Pat McGrath ranking series because she seems to really enjoy what I've been doing with like showing my outfit and the uh, makeup and the story time. So this brings me to all of you who are probably coming from Mia's channel and are wondering <laughs> what the fuck is going on. Hi, my name is Mariam and I have a healthy obsession with Pat McGrath and her makeup and over the summer I did a video where I ranked my Pat McGrath palettes and it felt a little bit anticlimactic because it was like done in one video and I didn't really want it to be done so I decided that I'm going to go through my whole list and basically do a video with each of the palettes down the ranking until we reach number one. So what you're here for today is the number two palette on my ranking which I'm going to mention in a second. But just to give you a heads up how this video works because you're probably a little bit surprised about the structure Somewhere along the road, I started showing my outfits of the day and um, people seemed to enjoy it, so I kind of kept doing it. And the other thing that I kind of started without really planning on it was uh, story time. So I thought it's a little bit boring to just do my makeup, so I started like telling little stories. So without further ado, number two on my ranking of Pat McGrath palettes is the absolutely gorgeous subversive palette. I absolutely adore this palette and I almost feel like it's a little bit of a misunderstood palette. People tend to rank this palette pretty low, except for Alicia from Kinky Sweat who absolutely loves this palette too. And I feel like the reason is this palette is misunderstood is because upon first glance it looks a little bit discombobulated. It looks a little bit like it's not very cohesive and you don't really know what to do with it because there are many standout colors but not one theme. until you look at this palette as your 
smoky eye palette as the palette that is going to give you a wide variety of different smoky eye looks and I feel like that is when your whole viewpoint of subversive can completely flip. Don't buy this palette if you think that this is the Pat McGrath palette that you're going to be pulling out to use on a daily basis. If you like to wear smoky eyes and there are definitely more subtle looks that you can achieve with this palette, sure, go for it. But for the most part, this is a palette of super stunning, super outstanding smoky eye looks. I'm going to refer you to my Project 5 Wears video if you would like to get more inspiration on what to do with this palette. But for today's video I'm going to remain boring as fuck and I'm going to do a look with the Gigabyte, which in my opinion is one of the most stunning eyeshadows that Mother Pet has ever created. I just... nothing, nothing in the world can compare to Gigabyte. I have very strong feelings for this eyeshadow as you can imagine. And what I also feel like, because I'm wearing these like rusty pumpkin-y tones, this shade is just going to like contrast my outfit so well. The look I'm going to go for is relatively simple. I'm going to pop this into sort of like my crease area and I'm going to show you that you can blend this shade out to be a little bit more subtle even though it is so deep. I'm going to use this on my outer corner and I might actually pop it a little bit on my lid and uh, try Gigabyte over top. And I know that Antipad really likes to put her uh, special shades over top of a black to make them really stand out. Then on my inner corners I'm probably going to put this shade with a little bit of this one over top. And on my lower lash line I'm going to pop this gorgeous chocolate brown here. Now the reason I'm telling you what shade is going to go where in the very beginning of the video is because I want to now focus on story time. So in my last two installments on this series I talked about my work, which I don't really often do on my channel. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am a working biomedical scientist, I currently work as a postdoc. And in the previous two episodes of uh, this ranking series, I talked about my time as a PhD student. I talked a little bit about my research during my PhD and I figured uh, talking about science might be a little bit scary for those of you who have never been on my channel before. And I also wanted it to be a special episode, so I thought I'm going to share what is possibly one of my absolute most special memories in my whole life and that is my PhD graduation. So to start off with, my uh, graduation ceremony was the very last day of April in 2015 after seven and a half years of literal blood, sweat and tears. So in order to graduate in the Netherlands or at least in the university where I did my PhD, you need to have a certain amount of um, peer-reviewed papers which you have published as a first author. It doesn't work if you are somewhere in the middle. And you need to uh, also write a thesis and your thesis is like a literal fucking book. It gets an ISBN number and you basically need to like write a very detailed introduction. You need to include your peer-reviewed papers as chapters. Whatever has not been reviewed uh, needs to be included as a chapter as well. Then you need to write a discussion. Um, you need to also include like uh, acknowledgements and a short summary in Dutch. It's like a whole thing. Due to some unfortunate circumstances, my PhD took on average a little bit longer than necessary. I think if you're very very lucky you tend to graduate between your uh, fourth and fifth year because four years is actually the standard amount of time that's given by the universities in the Netherlands and if you don't manage it can, it can take anywhere from six, seven to even ten years. And what happens once you have written your book? Your book needs to be approved by three members of the so-called manuscript committee and after that, you can schedule finally your PhD graduation ceremony. Now, your thesis defense here, I wouldn't really call it a defense because you're not really defending anything. At the point at which the manuscript committee approves of your thesis book, you are pretty much done. The rest is just for show, the rest is just for the family, the rest is just to have a nice ceremony to close off such a significant time in your life. There are some standard components to the ceremonies in the Netherlands, like each university has some similar components, but there are also quite a lot of differences. So what I'm going to describe is um, how the ceremony is done in the university where I am. So the ceremony lasts for an hour. It is a public defense, which means that anyone can attend it. And basically, in those and in that one hour, you have to do two things. First, you need to give the so-called uh, layman talk or lekepraatje, as they call it in Dutch, 
which is a short description of your work. You can only have 10 minutes for that, not a minute longer. And it is actually quite a feat to give your layman talk because we are talking about squeezing four potentially more years of research into 10 minutes and also making it accessible for everyone to understand. Because most of the times these ceremonies are also attended by family members, friends, colleagues who may not be in the same field as you are. Another very interesting component of the ceremony is the so-called paranympha. I don't really know how to translate it in English because it sounds really stupid to call them paranyms, but that, that's how they are called. They're basically... I feel like they come from an old-fashioned tradition uh, from a time when you literally had to defend your thesis. So imagine, you know, if you were having a duel, like once upon a time, and you would bring your two guys, you know, with like the stopwatch and want to give you the guns and defend your honor in case you died or something. This is what your paranympha are there for. They are there to defend your fucking honor during your defense. That is a very old-fashioned, um, I think, tradition. And it has changed over the years to the point where now Paranymphon are not people that can do anything for you in terms of like the actual defense. Although I think it depends on the university. I've heard that uh, in some universities is actually courtesy for one of the questions from the manuscript committee to be addressed during the ceremony. I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, to the paranympha and for them to actually be able to be a part of the ceremony. But in the university where I was defending, uh, that was not the case. And the thing is, um, nowadays your paranympha cannot really even help you with that because they can be literally anyone. You could like ask your friends, your cousin, your mom, anyone to be your paranympha. It doesn't have to be your colleagues. A lot of people do choose for their colleagues. Personally, I chose for that because I felt like um, I wanted people besides me who share the experience, who have um, been there for me during this uh, journey and even though your family and friends are a huge part of that, I feel like your colleagues are the ones who witness it firsthand. I chose two guys, uh, two fellow PhD students with whom we actually started around the same dates. I'm going to take a somewhat more precise pencil brush so that I can really pack the color onto my outer corner. We're going for a really smoky eye look today. So aside from the manuscript committee, your supervisor, of course, uh, the dean of the university who are present at that ceremony, you also have the so-called, I'm sorry, it's really how it's called, and I'm a little bit afraid that the term is now tainted, They're, it's called the corona. So aside from the manuscript committee, you also have at least like three or four uh, additional professors who are called the opposition. The opposition is also like quite an old-fashioned term. I think they're supposed to like challenge you, but the whole point is that the members of the manuscript committee and the other members of the corona, sorry that's how they're called, have to ask you questions for the additional like 45 minutes or so that you have left um, from the actual ceremony after you have given your layman talk. And these are usually professors from other departments, professors who are not necessarily in your field of research. Um, you have to have also international members on that committee. It's quite a challenge to even schedule the day of your defense because you can imagine all of these professor people, they're really, really busy. So getting them to be present on the same day at the same time is exceptionally difficult. So I think I had like seven dates that I could choose from and only one, only for one of those dates, everyone was available. As you can imagine, my defense being the crown jewel of my career and something that meant so much to me because I had worked so hard towards it pretty much like half of my life, ever since I decided that I'm going to uh, pursue biomedical sciences as a career. This has been the pinnacle of my career so far. It was such an important day, so you can imagine I really wanted to have my parents there with me, my family. So my uh, parents flew over from Bulgaria, my husband's parents, my brother and sister-in-law all took a day off so that they can be present at the ceremony because the ceremony was on a work day at half past four in the afternoon. I'm taking just a little bit more of that black shade towards the inner part of the lid, but I'm kind of fluffing it in so that the intensity is not as much anymore. So my parents were there and after the ceremony my mom wanted to treat everyone to a couple of homemade treats. So I woke up the day, of course, my pants were shaking, I was so so incredibly nervous. I had practiced my layman talk so many times that you could probably like 
poke me out of my dreams in the middle of the night and I would be able to recite it. I really just wanted to be very well prepared for it. I had gone through my book, I had like post-its all over my book with questions that might be asked by the committee and some potential answers that I could already think of. Um, so I woke up, I was super nervous and I remember that at one point um, shortly before we were about to leave for the aula where the ceremony was going to take place I was like okay now I'm going to do my makeup and then my mom was talking to me and I was like mom no we need some quiet time now I'm going to focus on my makeup so that I can meditate a little bit please don't talk to me I think she was a little bit offended by my reaction but you can imagine when all of your family is zooming around the whole day and you have something nerve-wracking uh, coming to you the whole day that you need a few minutes to really like just talk to your inner self and prepare for what's about to come. I'm going to take Gigabyte now just on my finger and pop it all over my lid. So at that time my makeup career was mostly focused on indie makeup so I was using brands like Notoriously Morbid, Darling Girl, My Pretty Zombie, Concrete Minerals and actually for the day of the defense the owner of Darling Girl had made a special eyeshadow in her super glittery formula, of course. She created a special shade for me with like the exact dual crowns and shifts that I asked her for and the shade was called A Doctor's Dream. Now, it pains me to say that Darling Girl doesn't exist anymore, but I know that A Doctor's Dream did very well and she actually kept it as a permanent shadow in her collection. Actually, you know what? I'm going to pop it out and show you because I still have, of course, A Doctor's Dream in my stash. So this is a doctor's dream. A doctor's dream is a lavender purple filled with like bluish greenish sparkle and a little bit of like a silvery duochrome running through it. I hope that you're able to see it a little bit. I'm not going to swatch it because I feel like this video is going to be like 15 years uh, if I continue to ramble like this. But yes, I was also wearing like really special makeup. I took at least an hour to do my makeup because I really wanted to just have a bit of a quiet time before the ceremony. So we left towards the aula. I'm taking a little bit of that gigabyte shade now, by the way, just to blend here through my crease because um, the way my lids are, the like the sparkly shade is going to stamp up on my uh, hood here anyway so I might as well just put it on there now. So we left uh, towards the aula around I think half past three. And when we arrived the two boys, uh, my partner and infant, were already there ready to support me. I was obviously shaking with nerves and then at half past four sharp everyone is already seated and then you walk in with uh, your paranif on one side, you and then your other paranif, you walk down this like red carpet, it's like a fucking wedding I'm telling you, and then uh, the whole corona and like your supervisor and the dean are already waiting for you. Are they already waiting for you? No they're not, they enter after you. So everyone has already like uh, taken their place except for the corona members with who enter as last. And then once the ceremony starts, you have to say like a few of these like official lines and then you proceed to your layman talk. I killed, obviously, my layman talk. I felt like I was on top of my game during those first like 10-12 minutes because obviously I had practiced it so many times um, and I had already discussed the contacts with my supervisor. So, you know, it was, it was the only 10 minutes of the ceremony that I had any control over, so I tried to make sure that those 10 minutes are executed to the best of my abilities. And after that, the first um, questions are always asked by the manuscript committee members. I'm popping, by the way, my inner corner highlight shade. And the first two questions I handled really well, they were not incredibly difficult, and I was like, okay, I'm getting in the swing of things here. And then, the third question, posed by this incredibly kind, unassuming professor, completely threw me off my game. And I think the problem is, he probably hadn't had the proper time to read my thesis, and he asked me a question that honestly felt like, I, I'm not even sure he knows what he wants to ask me. It was so confusing and like, so weirdly worded, and you can imagine, you're there, sweating through your head. I discovered that you can sweat through your face excessively. You're there, you know, shaking, sweating, and then someone comes slightly unprepared and throws you completely off your game. So when he posted that question for what felt like 10 minutes to me, I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't like think of anything to say. And my mom told me later that she saw me and she just literally wanted to jump and like hug me and come and help me out. 
By the way, I'm already going to tight line my upper lashes with a black pencil. So in the end, I came out of my shock and I was able to like answer something. I mean, you're always able to in the end uh, say something, but it was definitely, I definitely didn't quite understand what he wanted to know. And when I talked to my colleagues later, like the ones who have actually done the research and knew what he was trying to ask, they were also like, we have no fucking clue what he was trying to ask you. Uh, so it was a really like shitty question. But the thing is that we weren't even halfway through with the question with the questions and he already threw me off my game because you can imagine that in a moment like this your self-confidence just drops dramatically and you need some time to recover from it. So I feel like I did recover from it and I was able to answer the rest of the questions to the best of my abilities of course. I'm going to grab a little uh, pencil liner by the way, this is just one of my Kiko eyeshadow sticks popping it on my lower lash line. So I was able to recover from this but deep down I feel like I could have done a much better job had I remained on that high of self-confidence that I had in the very beginning of the ceremony. And then the moment every PhD student during their um, thesis defense longs for is the moment when the uh, ceremony master comes back and they, and they do this, like they stamp on the floor with like this really big stick and they say ora est, which in Latin means the hour has passed. The words every PhD student longs to hear because that absolves them of their misery. So that uh, indicates the ceremony has finished, uh, everyone should stop asking you questions and the uh, manuscript committee retreats in order to deliberate for 10 minutes. Basically they're just going to get a coffee and talk about your defense because you are definitely getting that diploma. Unless you fuck up royally and I've never heard of anyone fucking up so royally that they wouldn't get the diploma at that point. In 10 minutes they come back and then you get your diploma. By the way, I'm putting that brown shade now in my waterline and my lower lash line. So as soon as the ceremony was over, I went to my family, I went to talk to my colleagues, we had a short chat about that question that threw me off and they made me feel a little bit better because they were like, yeah, we also didn't quite know what he was trying to ask you, so don't feel too bad about it, you did really well. This is the final look you guys, I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to know what's on my lips, please ask me in the comment section because I would actually very much like to finish my story time. So after the uh, manuscript committee, like the corona came back, I was presented with my uh, diploma and after that is another really lovely part of the ceremony which is called the Laudatio when basically your supervisor addresses you. So my supervisor um, stands up and then he addresses me personally in front of everyone and he talks a little bit about my journey during my PhD studies. He talks about a little bit of the research, the hardships that I've encountered during my research. He also talks a little bit about me as a person. He didn't fail to mention my YouTube channel in some of the very bizarre <laughs> titles of videos that I had in the very beginning because I was doing a lot of tutorials with like indie makeup and I would put the names of the actual eyeshadows as the titles of my tutorials and you can imagine the most bizarre combinations came up. But it was it's a moment during the ceremony when you're already like everything is done, you're relieved and all you are left with is smiles and tears. And it's a very emotional part of the ceremony. Whew. I, I might be tearing up right now. I did not see that coming. So, it's a very emotionally charged part of the ceremony. It's really wonderful and everyone really enjoys their laudatio. Um, most supervisors tend to give a very sweet one. After that there was, like I said, a little bit of like snacks and drinks after the actual ceremony and in the evening. Myself, my family and my group, the people from my uh, research group that I did my PhD uh, studies with, we headed to my favorite pizza restaurant, we had a wonderful evening and honestly, even though it was such an emotionally charged day, I feel like for the most part I really enjoyed it and it's also something that I try to remind other people whenever they're going to do their defense, try to enjoy the day because it's a very special day. You can only experience it once and I know it's nerve-wracking but you also need to enjoy it a little bit. I've actually been a paranymph myself a couple of times and I can tell you being a paranymph is almost as nerve-wracking as it is being a uh, the PhD student walking because you kind of like sympathize with the person who is standing on the podium, you know, presenting and addressing all the questions and you're like so nervous on their behalf. The day after the ceremony I woke up light as a feather, light as I had not felt in many many years. Because your PhD is like when you start, at the very start of your PhD your professor hands you this like little pebble to carry in your pocket and then over the course 
of your PhD and over the years that pebble grows to the size of a humunculus boulder that you have to carry on your shoulders the whole time. It is heavy, I tell you. So the day after my PhD defense I felt like finally that boulder has been lifted off my shoulders and I could soar in the sky. It was such a liberating experience. They have a very nice word for it in Dutch, it's uh, nagenieten, which basically means that I continued to like bask in the enjoyment of that day for like days to come. I think that I was processing this day for like at least a month after that because I kept thinking about uh, the way it went, about how much I enjoyed it, about how nervous I was, about what I could have answered to some of the questions instead of the actual answers that I gave. I just kept processing it for a very long time. And with that, I think I'm going to close off this incredibly long video. I'm going to thank Mia for collabing with me. I'm so curious what she did for her part of the collab for this video. I can't wait to watch it. Thank you so much, Mia. Closing off Subversive at number two. We're going to see each other next week or next time because I'm not sure where when next time is going to be for number one on my ranking, which you guys know is my first love uh, with Pat McGrath, which is the Sublime Palette. Don't be scared, it's not going to be the last video because as you guys know I've decided as an addendum to also include the three new quads from this year's holiday collection. So there are there are still four more episodes coming in this series and I'm planning something super fun for next year to substitute this series. Thank you so much for watching, all of you lovely folk who are usually hanging around my channel, all of you people who might be coming from Mia's channel and you made it all the way to the uh, ending of this video. If you would like to see more of my face, don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you in my next video. Bye!